session is designed to provide an opportunity for citizens to express their views on matters of concern to the school committee. The sessions are not designed to encourage debate or lengthy exchange of views, but are to have the committee understand numerous points of view. The committee would appreciate speakers keeping their presentation to three minutes in order to accommodate as many people as time permits. The chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers on the same topic to three. All speakers must be at least 18 years of age or enrolled in high school in the Lynn Public Schools District and having discussed their views with a student government representative. The chair reserves the right to rule the speaker out of order if he or she feels that the speaker's comments are personal in nature. If a speaker's comments are directed at a school committee member or a member of school administration in attendance, that member through the chair may address the individual. The sessions, the sessions will promptly commence 15 minutes prior to the start of the school committee meeting. Is anyone here wishing to speak at open mic? Anyone for open mic? Last call for open mic. Seeing none, that concludes open mic. Call to order the first special meeting of the school committee, uh, March 2nd, 2023. Um, start with uh, roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Present. Member Coppola? Present. Member Dugan? Present. Member Gately? Present. Member Magnolia? Present. Member Pena? Present. Mayor Nicholson? Present. We'd also like to welcome our new student representative from Fecto O'Leary, Madison Brown. Welcome. Yeah, Great to have you here. Uh, if we could all please rise for a salute to the flag and remain standing for a moment of silence. <clears throat> So please remain standing and for a moment of silence in recognition of Janice Abernathy, retired teacher, February 5th, 2023. Patricia Phelps, retired clerk, February 6th, 2023. Maria Penacucci, retired cafeteria worker, February 13th, 2023. Thank you. All right, first item is the minutes. I'd like to make a motion to accept the third regular meeting on February 9, 2023. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Let's have it. Next is a school nurse election. What's the recommendation to the superintendent? I recommend that we uh, elect to hire um, the, a new nurse, Kathleen Walsh. The World Committee. So moved. Second. Second. All right, roll call and remember we need to say the name. Mm -hmm. Member Castellanos? Kathleen Walsh. Member Coppola? Kathleen Walsh. Member Dugan? Kathleen Walsh. Member Gately? Kathleen Walsh. Member Magnolia? Kathleen Walsh. Member Pena? Kathleen Walsh. Mayor Nicholson? Kathleen Walsh. Next item is a curriculum update. Yes, we have uh, Kara Zabricki, uh, new assistant director uh, addition to our team in curriculum and MLE. Uh, working on our world languages, and she's going to present for you uh, some of the plans and goals and growth that we would like to see happen in world languages. Go ahead, Kara. Thank you, Deb. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kara Zabricki. Um, I'm currently in the new world language position, and here's a brief overview of tonight's agenda. Um, short and sweet, with world language as an asset. We're going to talk about the path, something called the Pathway Awards. If you could just try to speak in the microphone, if you can, for, particularly you. for people that are uh, watching at home. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, I have it here too. Great. Um, so World Language as an Asset, the Pathway Awards, placement data, middle school servant, school ser interest survey, excuse me, I'm nervous, World Language Programming, <laughs> and current year successes. So we'll start off with World Language as an Asset. In 2021, DESE shifted from the term foreign language to world language to focus on multilingualism as an asset and to encourage students to be productive members of a 21st century global society. 
DESE updated the framework to emphasize proficiency-based outcomes over grammar-based performance. Currently, we are using world language student data to elevate and celebrate the linguistic assets of our school community, more accurately place students in world language courses, raise the rigor for upcoming students, and leverage first language literacy in Spanish to accelerate English language development. This year, we will be celebrating uh, fifth and eighth grade students who demonstrate bilingualism and biliteracy during their moving on ceremonies. Our ability to fund testing for these students is a direct result of a grant. Our hope is to encourage students to elevate and celebrate multilingualism in our school community and encourage long-term language study. Sorry. Um, as a side note, students who earn the seal of biliteracy in high school will not only have the opportunity to add a skill to their resume, but they can also earn college credit. Moving on to world language placement data. As mentioned in the previous slide, all eighth grade students have already taken the stamp assessment. Results not only qualify students for the bilingual, bil biliteracy pathway award, but will also determine their high school world language placement. Traditionally, regardless of proficiency level, students who have never taken a Spanish course have been placed in Spanish one or two. Feedback from educators and guidance counselors indicates a disconnect between this lower level course placement and our students' linguistic ability. Communication about addressing this will be provided in the upcoming slides. As you can see here, currently 125 ninth grade students are taking intermediate and upper level Spanish classes, Spanish three and up. This year, 358 students placed into these courses. This is nearly three times as many students who placed into inter intermediate and upper level courses as are currently taking them now. Based on this data, we are moving from 10.7% of ninth grade students enrolled in upper level courses to a projected 30.8%, which, which is a jump of 20.1 percentage points. Wow. Looking ahead, Lynn Public Schools has partnered with secondary DL dual language consultant, Dr. Chris Nichols, to align our world language program to meet the needs of both current and upcoming students. Let's see. Okay. Currently, LPS offers Spanish and Latin. Although the initial focus is on improving current world language courses, we recognize that LPS has limited course offerings and is not on par with other districts in terms of extensive and varied world language course offerings. For this reason, excuse me, for this reason, we are exploring the expansion of our future world language coursework. As part of this planning, we surveyed 348 students in grades seven and eight. We asked what students would choose if they could select a language other than Latin or Spanish at their school. ASL, American Sign Language, was at the top of that list. Based on this data and available staff, Lynn English High School will offer one section of ASL in academic year 2024. In fact, some staff members who are excited about this new offering are here in the audience tonight. Mm -hmm. They are. <laughs> they are. are. Lynn English High School World Language Department Chair Mike Haddad and our, and our very own a new ASL teacher, Heather Lang. Uh, this is, speaking of Mike Haddad, uh, this is a picture of, of uh, world, the World Language Fair that Ling Lynn English High School recently hosted. And finally, um, as part of the district's focus on elevating and celebrating multilingualism, the Lynn Public Schools collaborated with union leadership to provide the first opportunity for LPS staff to earn a $1,000 bilingual biliterate stipend. As of yesterday, uh, 161 staff members across four unions and 26 buildings have met the criteria. This is yet another way to value linguistic diversity in our schools. 
I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Dr. Mariela, yep. Yeah. Yes, um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, so out of curiosity, uh, other than the ASL, which was at the top, what were the other high-ranking languages? And um, I, I say this as a college professor, which is that students don't often know that Chinese <laughs> is a likely good language to learn if they're interested in international finance, for instance instance so how um would like mandarin be offered if that was something that the students didn't identify but that the world languages department decided should be within the course offerings can you talk a little bit about prioritization and how you're going about that yes that's a great question um surprisingly the student data indicates very eurocentric uh you know uh, top choices such as French, which believe it or not, we lost due to lack of student interest in teachers. Um, it was like French, Italian, Portuguese. <laughs> so um, some students did select other. I tried to be realistic in what we could possibly offer. Mm. Um, so I don't believe I had Mandarin on there, but I can follow up with that survey data and send that to you. Sure. Well, I was just thinking about some of the demographics of Lynn. So both Arabic and Mandarin suggest themselves, given what is sort of happening with regards to international business in the world, but also our own populations. I just don't know that students would necessarily, if they didn't themselves speak Mandarin or Arabic, right. identify those languages. That's why I'm wondering about if it's just the survey data or if we're thinking about who we have within our population. Obviously, the teaching of... Um, a foreign language is a very specific skill set, but also I, I do know that Lynn is rich with Arabic speakers um, and maybe Mandarin not as much, but certainly present. So thank you. Thank you. Member Pena and then Member Castellanos. Thank you for your presentation. This is much needed in our schools. And uh, I, I had a question. Uh, you received the grant to fund the fifth and eighth grade. Did you know um, how much that grant was or? Any idea I on believe that? it. Um, Rania might need to help me out here, but I believe it was ninety-seven thousand dollars. Something to that. Awesome. Too. Okay, that's excellent. Um, this is uh, like like I said, this is much needed, and uh, I think we answered some of the questions. That I, another question that I had: How do you place um, pr uh, place priority priority? You know, with the languages, and um, I had the I had the opportunity today to go to school and read to. Um, to some of the students and I read a bilingual book and they were amazed that I I read a book in Spanish and them kids like they reacted and this is so good much needed for our district thank you very much I really appreciate this thank, thank you. you and if I might add you know part of our prioritization has to do with improving our current offering which is Spanish like believe yes. it or not it 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 needs to be improved significantly absolutely I um, agree so I think that's where you know our focus is now but we do see the need to yes. expand yes. language offerings as well thank you very much you're welcome great work remember Castellanos. first off i want to say thank you for your presentation there's nothing <coughs> to be nervous about with all these people staring at you <laughs> <laughs> every, on every word like no it's um <clears throat> it just for folks in the audience um mr Bricky was my spanish teacher oh. two years i appreciate her she kept me up she kept me online i always appreciated her she's very strong <laughs> Instructor, I always, uh, always grateful for Thank those you. opportunities there. And I, it's, 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 it's interesting. It's always good to, it's full circle. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually very impressed with the the look in the head feature of your presentation. Uh, some reason when I was hearing what we were looking to do, looking to get into, I, I thought about workforce development. I think about the translation training certificate programs out there. I think about enhancing our students experiences here like you said like it, it could lead to future professional opportunities in the language field and and we could tap into our natural uh what we have it's just it's, 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 it's right in front of us so building out um this program and really developing that foundation that you're that you're mentioning uh, i think it's very important Am I close to where is that? I hear the nods, right? I, yeah. I, 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 I agree. Up, am I on the same track? 
Uh, you are, Brian. Okay, I, I agree that it's extremely important, and I think the sale by literacy is one thing that can help catapult our students. We actually had four students, four eighth graders, wow. earn the criteria to meet the seal, even though it's only for high school students. Wow, that's amazing. So, yeah. Well, we okay. say limited, like, world language course offerings. Like, what, what, so what are some of the ways to increase that? Like, what are we looking to, to do to modify that and increase? Like, what are we doing? I think it's going to take a lot of planning and preparation. I think it's going, I mean, you, you talk about having the teachers, having the proper curriculum, mapping, uh, text. But I, when I say expand, I'm, I'm actually referring to not only improving our current offerings, but also um, increasing the amount of languages that we do offer to students so there is choice for them. With, with 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 Spanish though, I think that's something that's very it's, it's right. It is a heavy percent that we could really tap in and and, and take the lead on that. Um, very impressed. I'm very grateful for taking time today to learn about this. And I when I saw it coming into our meeting today, I was a happy. I was a happy. Thank you, Brian. I was happy, boy. Agradecido, <laughs> agradecido. <laughs> Thank you. You want to say Did everybody it? hear that? You want to say it? <laughs> okay. You want to add it to the mic so the public can hear it. Okay, so at Lynn English High School, we did, um, we are offering French and Ancient Greek as well as the ASL and the Spanish and Latin. Great. Emma Capola. Okay. Um, as a grandmother of a daughter who's in, granddaughter who's in second grade at Lynn Woods, um, who is an ASL speaker, she, um, has blossomed up there and partly you know has to do with the teachers and um, you know the signers that they have and um, and the principal who made sure that there was an ASL club after school last year for all of the first graders and um, you know I think there was 28 kids in the first grade the two first grades but uh, 22 kids signed up for that club Mm -hmm. as well as the kids in the other grades are learning ASL. So I think um, it's a wonderful program because of a lot of our kids that are in special ed um, may not have a language, but the ASL will be their language. And their peers, if they take this and they become, you know, uh, even as a beginner, but eventually proficient, can um, really engage with them and really become peers, whether it's on sporting teams, clubs, you know, or whatever. So it's very, very exciting for me. I know my daughter's probably cry at home crying because that's usually what she does when she <laughs> finds out something new has happened, you know. And I, the superintendent, Ruggieri, had kind of tipped me off that she was going in that direction. But sometimes in Lynn Public Schools, we move kind of slowly, so I didn't have too much hope that maybe I would see it in my granddaughter's time, but ob quite obviously, you guys have moved really quickly, and I appreciate it, just speaking um, in regards to my granddaughter, but all the other kids that are really going to benefit, like Zachary and Jack, who are in our audience tonight, and um, who I'm very proud of, too, the two boys that work very hard. Thank you, though, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I also just note uh, to Member Capola's uh, point about Lynn Woods, we are developing a lot of kids who mm. already are learning ASL. Yeah. And so in middle school, I see that potentially there could be an a offering there because these kids are going to move up. And they already are beginning to develop those skills. So by the time that they get to high school, we're going to have quite a few people, students, who are going to be interested in that. Um, so I'm thrilled that it's there. And I agree that a lot of our special ed students, really, it's a world language that they can take and really get a lot of use out of. And, and just one other thing, I, a, a parent up in the Lynn Woods when I was picking my granddaughter up one day, she said to me, um, my daughter learned it so fast, the language, and she said, on, uh, she came home and on the weekend she said, I'm not speaking any English to you, it's all in ASL and you're going to have to learn it. <laughs> and she signed the whole weekend and the mother was like, 
totally lost, you know. <laughs> but they're bringing it home, you know, to others in the family. So. Yeah. Yeah. That program is amazing. Mm -hmm. I had the good fortune of being able to visit it, and you know, it's um, the people sitting behind me are in large part to thank for. Yeah, I think one has her hand up to try to say something. Um, if I could add to what you were saying, um, we have a club at school. We've had it for two years for sign language, um, and we also do. Um, one of my admin duties at school is to work with the life skill students. Um, with sign language a couple of days a week as well. So we do have inspiration That's awesome. That's awesome. That's great. That's great. great. Uh, Member Gailey. Uh, good job, Kara. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't at English when you were there. I think I had left or you might have just started. I, I think you were at your tail end. I was still there. That's what I remember. <laughs> um, the, and now that Mrs. Coppola just spoke. I'm wondering, uh, is there a seal of literacy for the American Sign Language? Yes, I believe it is offered in American Sign Language, yes. That's awesome to know. Um, I got a call from a parent, or actually someone that's like um, guiding um, uh, an Afghanistan family in the city of Lynn, because we had a large inflection of them. So I was just wondering if we, if we offer Persian, all right, would we, could you look into seeing if we need Persian? I guess that is Dari, Persian is Dari or something? Yeah, we, we don't offer, offer any other languages besides the ones that were listed. So I think research and, and figuring out what the need is in the community is will be important as we move forward, but unfortunately yeah. we don't know. Yeah, because it was... Um, yeah, they wanted to look into something up at Lynn English that night, think of you. But you did a great job on your presentation first time. No time. You're very to kind. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. This is, this is a great um, development. I really love the framing in the beginning to moving from the idea of, of foreign languages to world languages and thinking of all this as an asset. You can see that bear out in the data about you know, really drilling down on how ready people are. Um, and I think that the progress on the ASL is really exciting. And thank you for the presentation and to your whole team for the great work. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next item is a field trip request. Uh, what's the recommendation of the superintendent? I absolutely <coughs> recommend this. Uh, I want to share with you, uh, and they'll be at our next meeting, but um, our uh, Marine Corps Junior ROTC students represented once again uh, for Lynn in the regional drill meet and have been invited to compete in the national level in Virginia this coming April. And so I highly recommend approval of this trip. The will of the committee? So moved. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Next item is the Camp Rotary proposal. Yes. Come on up, Please, Dr. Dr. Cardell. Cardell. Uh, so similar to uh, Member Gately, my son actually went to Camp Rotary as well. Uh, Rich and I go way back. Uh, Rich was my substitute teacher when I was pregnant with my first son. <laughs> and that's how we met, and we've been friends ever since. And so I am thrilled to have him here uh, with his offerings uh, that he does annually for our students in Lynn. And so I'll turn it over to you sure. so you can share. Thank you. Thanks once again for allowing us to come forward. Uh, especially for the new members of the school committee, I just wanted to make sure that you were aware. Camp Rotary started in 1921. Uh, it's up in Boxford, Massachusetts, but it's even though it's only about 35 minutes from here, you would think you were out into the middle of New Hampshire or Maine. And first time I went there, that's exactly what I thought. So I came in and looked around. And I said, "Wow!" And it's on Stiles Pond, which is a it's a pretty good sized pond. There are four camps on the pond, but Camp Rotary is the only overnight camp. So I started there 30, 
this is my 31st year as director. And I saw the overlap when I was an educator here in the Lynn Public Schools, um, later on to be principal. The, uh, the overlap between the education that the kids were getting in school was supplemented incredibly by the life experiences that they were getting and the independence that they were getting to go away to a summer camp. And the Rotary Club, when it started, it was actually trying to get Lynn students out of Lynn for part of the summer to go up to enjoy a, a non-urban uh, type of experience and to get them out there fishing and doing all the traditional experiences that, the, that you see at a summer camp. The YMCA ran it at that time, and the Lynn Rotary Club said, we'll, we'll build it we'll build a camp for you if you will run it. So the YMCA ran it for a really long time. Um, but about 30, 32 years ago, the Lynn Rotary Club uh, opted to take it, due to financial situations, took it back away from the, Rotary, uh, the YMCA and ran it independently. And right around then is when I was uh, hired as the director. So probably, I think it's about 10 years ago at this point, I petitioned the board of directors of the of the camp to say we're we're falling away from our mission because of the price of camp. It started to become much harder for the average parent in Lynn to be able to afford to send their their child to camp. So that petition back to the camp's uh, board of directors was heard. And we started by saying, what if we could come up with about 20 spots to give to the Lynn schools? And what we could do, I have my heart uh, is always on the side of principals. I said, we could give it to the principals to be able to actually use. Because a real lot of times, uh, gifts that we get as principals or, or programs that we get are earmarked right to a specific uh, person or a specific demographic. And I said, I really would like the principals to be able to pick and choose who they would like to send. Because as a principal, oftentimes, you really know the kid that needs a week away. And that could be somebody that's just been through a trauma recently. It could be somebody that has shown incredible progress and improvement that you really like to recognize. Somebody who embodies your uh, school's values and you really think this is somebody that we really want to give, give a reward to. So that's how it started. And then a few years ago, the camp has really been doing well in its enrollment. So because of that, there's it's generating a little bit more money and the board of directors said, let's increase it. So we actually went from 20 up to 30, and then it got up to 40. So last year, we were at 54. So that's where we are again this year. So uh, we're awarding 54 scholarships, same, uh, same way that we were talking about. So the principals, after you approve it, I'll send an email out to the principal saying it's been approved again, and then they make their own selection process as to how they're going to pick their two students and then they get to pick two. Um, we give two to all of the uh, all of the principals and we give one to each of the alternative schools as well um, and it's been it's been relatively successful with the alternative students as well because a lot of times it's uh, it's it's not forcing them to sit and be quiet in, in a classroom setting. It's very active. The kids are running around uh, like most of the day. So it's actually been kind of a, it been, been very nice for that as well. Now, this is the first year, which is really cool to say. This is the first year that I'm, I'm really happy to say that one of our former Lane Kids to Camp recipients is joining our staff this year so uh, that wow. that's that's huge because that just starts the cycle the positive cycle um, rolling in that direction so that it ends up with just like multiplying the benefits honestly when I look at and I've reported out to my to my board when I look at the good that camp does we do a real lot of good for kids we do even more for staff. The staff that the staff that. <laughs> speaking of which, there he is right there on cue, Christian. 
This is a surprise, not a setup, I promise. <laughs> Oh, man. Wow. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, Great. <laughs> cue oh, the dance, moves. girl. The, um, <laughs> but, um, at, at any rate, I was just saying that the staff, uh, the staff that, that come are former campers. Almost all of our staff come with, from within the ranks. And what happens is that they, they actually just fall in love with the atmosphere, the positivity and everything that's going on. And by doing that, once they commit to that, like they're committing their entire summer to be up there making a difference in kids' lives. And it's it's just a, a great place for for that level, not just the camper, but for the next level up to to really grow into themselves as as late high school and and college students. And I I know looking at a few of you that have had the experience, I know you know firsthand that uh, that that's true. So and looking where is oh yeah i'm looking over my shoulder at the mayor's assistant here too um it's uh, it's it's just i was telling Danya that it's amazing how many alumni i run into as i'm as i'm going around and i said and they're all like this young man here just stellar people that uh, that have grown into themselves really well so i talked a lot more than i usually do so that was for the benefit i'll say it was for the benefit of the new uh, the new members on the benefit council. of us all we appreciate it yeah <laughs> what is the will of the committee yeah remember Gailey. <laughs> i just want to say thank you that's all michael's doing great he loved he learned how to be an lit cit then he was the um what was the next step? He went through all the steps. Unit head. He, yeah, he was a counselor. He was a unit, unit head, and then he was a CIT director, and exactly. he learned a lot. So I can't thank you enough, and this is an opportunity of a lifetime. And I really highly recommend it. Good. Make a motion that we accept the generous offer of Camp Rotary proposal to fund 54 Lynn students to Camp Rotary for one week of summer camp 2023. Lynn kids to camp. Second. 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 Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Absolutely, yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Gata. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Very Great much seeing you. Much Thank you. Gatto. Thank you. Next item are uh, three donations from uh, two classical high school. What's the recommendation of the superintendent? I so request. To approve, please. Uh, Would you like me to read? Yes. Them? Okay. Uh, a motion to accept Valerie Travis and Robert Barker in the amount of fifty dollars to the boys' basketball team of Lynn Classical. The Gleason Law Offices in the amount of two hundred fifty dollars to the boys' basketball team at Lynn Classical High School. And New England Bio Labs Inc. in the amount of six thousand dollars to the dance club at Lynn Classical High School. Second. 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 Roll call, please. Member Castellanos? Yes. Member Coppola? Yes. Member Dugan? Yes. Member Gately? Yes. Member Magnolia? Yes. Member Pena? Yes. Mayor Nicholson? Yes. Another request to accept a donation from parent Ekaterina Azarova of two gently used printers to Callahan Elementary School. What's the will, what's the recommendation of the superintendent? I recommend <coughs> to accept, please. So Amy. moved. Mm -hmm. Okay. A second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Next is a request to accept a donation of $2,000 from the Curtin family to the music department. The Curtin family is proud to make a donation to fund loaner instruments in memory of their mother, Shirley Curtin, a longtime band parent and supporter of the arts in the Lynn Public School System. That's a recommendation of the superintendent. I highly recommend. Second. Still moved. So moved. I think I heard a second, too. Second. Yeah. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Request to accept a donation from Tarte Cosmetics via Amazon wish list totaling $1,910 for three teachers at Harrington Elementary School. I just want to make a correction here. It's three teachers and three staff members, so it's actually six staff six. total. Okay. Um, and I highly recommend. What is it? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Next is the Student Engagement Task Force update. 
Yeah, so uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, I think we all know we had some challenges with behaviors, um, some uh, student on student violent behavior. And Mrs. Cohen and I had long conversations about how we could mitigate this and try to alleviate what was happening. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mrs. Cohen so she can explain the process that we took, what we've been able to achieve, and what we're still looking to work on. So thank you very much. I hope you can hear me OK. Um, so my, my message is very quick. It, we start with gratitude. So I would like to name the people who came to our first meeting on October 7th, because they really were the impetus for the work that continued. So to start with, uh, Deb Ruggiero and Kim Powers were there. Um, Danya Smith was there from the mayor's office. We also had Tina Hufenagel, uh, Aaron Heenan. We had Lauren, Kristen, and Gianni from the office, George Bacchus and Matt Durgan, Principal Braga and Principal Ritterhouse, Mike Economo and Jen Cash from, um, and Officer Wright um, from the police department, and Charlie Gallo as well. And so at that meeting, as you can see in the notes, we just set a few objectives. We wanted to look at some data points and possible reasons for the uptick in the student conflict. And then we wanted to describe immediate steps that would decrease that student conflict. And then finally, identify purpose goals and potential members going forward for community task force that would envision and engage the long-term work for supporting prevention and intervention. At that first meeting, we called it an anti-violence meeting, but we didn't really love that term because it's, it's really focused on the negative. Um, I do want to also recognize the time that Mayor Nicholson and Chief Reddy and some other officers who I'd like to name here, Deputy Chief Mike Vale, Deputy Chief Mark O'Toole, Lieutenant Tim Donovan, um, and again, <laughs> Danielle Smith was at all of these meetings, by the way. Um, we had several meetings to talk about what was happening in the city, but then on November 1st, we shifted gears and decided to focus on student engagement. What can we do? How can we create a healthy and positive environment and activities where students wouldn't feel as frustrated and deregulated or dysregulated? Um, and so that work started in November. So what all I'm going to do here is read the vision statement, and then we're going to celebrate the actual steps that we took and I have to thank uh, Superintendent Ruggiero for funding many of the action steps that we took and I look forward to the work we're gonna do going forward so the vision statement for that team was to seek to increase healthy relationships between students by increasing the engagement activities both inside and outside of the school day we also intend to and this work is continuing so we intend to build partnerships with other stakeholders such as building leadership continuing work with the Lynn Police Department local agencies and parents and family members in order to approach this dilemma with a community-oriented framework. So just going down um, the list, these are all the action steps that we've accomplished between November and now. Anthony Seaforth, who has a program in high school, piloted a program in middle school, an after-school program, to get students engaged. That student athlete mentality but it was really open to any middle school student so they're trying a new model in middle school uh, we added additional hall monitors both in high school and middle school we invited both project yes and all stars to expand in their staffing we're engaging in the play ball foundation which is um, they're going to fund adding sports and we're kicking that off right now in the spring that has no cost to LPS um, I'm leading up a research team on potential alternative <laughs> pathways for students who are in need of other methods and ways to diploma and beyond. So I look forward to reporting out on that later in the spring. Um, we're funding available drop-in gym after school to keep kids in a safe environment after school and, and really mm. start to create the healthy relationships that they're not creating on their own. Um, we had a wellness presentation to the principals and the clinical teams. We had de-escalation training in clinical teams and school staff. And then we just recently established the Educational Plan Learning Center at the Boys and Girls Club. And this is for students who unfortunately have uh, long-term suspension and they'll be able to be provided with some social emotional support and academic support. 
So that's all. those are all the things that we've accomplished. Moving forward, we're going to um, focus on so, a more uniform system for accomplishing some bullying prevention. I think bullying comes up often in the youth health risk survey, but we have to dig deeper into that and talk about um, some education around it, what it means, and ways to mitigate it. We're also doing a lot around anti-vaping. And I know we have members here on the school committee who are also on the health advisory. So we're, gonna, we're going to um, bring that into the next health advisory meeting. So I'm looking forward to that work as well. Um, and finally, the big, really the two big ones are we are trying to figure out how to create a town hall for family and community members around the needs of mental health and social emotional learning needs that are not being met. Where you know, and this is not just in the Lynn Public Schools. This is in many districts. Um, and then finally, we're moving towards a family engagement council. So that is the last meeting that we had. And so we are taking our time to come up with a very st uh, strategic plan on pulling together a family council. Because as you've seen at Open Mic, and we've received phone calls and emails, and principals are working with families who want to be involved in the work. Um, and there just has not been a venue for that other than to just call, but they want to actually engage in planning um, and participating in a council-like environment. So that, that is what we're working on now. Great. Member Cassianos, Member Pena, Member Dugan. Thank you so much for, for explaining this uh, wonderful initiative. It's actually it's very powerful when I first reviewed it, and, and I, I heard about it back in the fall, what you guys were doing. Um, I, it kind of got me itching for like, uh, when is the school health advisor? I was like fired up there. Like, I, I would like, I like the fact that you guys are um, infusing both. Mm -hmm. um, big, big action items on there. A lot of, lot of th those pending action steps. Um, very bold, uh, very respectable, respectable, and also very needed. Mm -hmm. um, the the student voice around this is phenomenal. I love the fact the stakeholders involved too. Are all, everyone's. Um, working cohesively together, I, I would just ask if, if we could add school committee involvement, I think in the stakeholders, I would recommend oh, two absolutely. members join mm -hmm. that. Like I would like to volunteer. I know on the, the we meet on the school health advisory committee, but it's very, it's, we don't meet as much. Um, and like some of the stuff that we went through, similar to what you went through here, um, I think Don and my son, I thought Don was at the last uh, at Marshall Middle School, Lorraine. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we got to see some of the, 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 it's actually the prevention, like we saw some of the data um, that matches this. Um, mm -hmm. We'd love to take part and, 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 and figure out ways to collaborate, um, especially when it comes to those, those pendant action items. Um, there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of different ways that we could fit in there. Um, my question for just the, just my only question I have around the preventative approaches that we've, we have taken. I know the Shannon Grant, I know Lynn PD has a Shannon Grant. Mm -hmm. um, what other funding sources are we, are we collaborating with other grants that we have or how are we doing this when, when we say we're funding? So the play ball is yeah. a grant <clears throat> through that foundation. I think the first year it's $25,000 and then each year it goes up. So um, where our goal is to build to a three sport um, model. Uh, so that's funded through that, doesn't cost us anything. We have to put the money out initially, but then we get reimbursed. Um, ESSER funds have been used uh, for some of this, especially for uh, Project Yes and um, Breed All Stars and the Open Gym. It's, uh, we felt very strongly that it fit right into the SEL lane of the buckets that uh, ESSER funds can be utilized for. But it also fits into the um, recovery of academic learning because even though it's not academic learning, that social and relation building that happens in those venues translate into classroom. And it allows kids to access their learning in a, in a much stronger way when they're building those relationships with classmates. So a lot of it is ESSER funds. Um, yeah. did, I don't think we used any titles funds. We, we haven't used titles, but we could pursue like the 21st century grant yeah. that um, LEAP uses for after school programming. 
um, after Esther runs out. Yeah. Well, that's my my concern was sustainability. Like yeah, in terms absolutely. of like, we don't want to like create this wonderful preventative you know program and take and all then these take steps it away. And then it Correct. Just, yeah. Then we hit a cliff financially and we can't sustain it. I promise you, <laughs> Kevin hears this from me all the time. <laughs> Um, I also don't want to be uh, see us have to take away anything. Uh, so every decision we make, we're looking at how can we sustain it and can we sustain it. And we do not move on it if we don't think we can sustain it. Wonderful. And the de-escalation training, like that, is that part of ESSER too as well? Um, no, so that is through our clinical team. Um, we have had that PD for a few years now. Um, Tina Hofnagel was part of the development of that PD. Uh, when it first rolled out years ago, it was specifically for staff. It was done like during faculty meetings, uh, PD days, that kind of thing. Um, during COVID, of course, things stopped because we were, weren't in person. Uh, so we hadn't revisited it in a while. And so bringing it back was a priority for us. Uh, that's why we brought it back. So the cost is, is there really isn't a cost other than, um, you know, the staff that is, are doing that training. Uh, but we try to utilize times that are part of the school day. You know, when I saw that, I thought about like a, a like a I don't know why I thought, but like a, a senior op, it's like an option for a senior or seniors to learn about de-escalation training. I don't know. Seniors if, as in, in high, high school? school? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think yeah, as an option, thought. I think de-escalation training is vital. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a great thought. I, I think it's important. I, I don't know when I first saw that, I, I was like, oh wow, we're we're, we're doing this with our students. That's what that's awesome. But then I realized that we, it was just for staff. But I would like to open that up to students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a Got wonderful it. training for life. Yeah. Yeah. Been through it, those trainings. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you, uh, Member Pena, Member Dugan, Member Gailey. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, this this is this is so important for our, our students. You know, um, I work with a nonprofit, Lenders Against Drug Abuse, and we do a lot of engagement and activities with the kids and, and talking about prevention and awareness and. Um, I'm a big fan of um, Tony Seifert, so I, I you know, my, actually my son attends his after school program at Classical High School, and uh, bringing that to middle school, to, you know, to breed, and um, that is awesome, you know. Um, also, like the, what I, what really stuck out to me, stood out to me was this, uh, the town hall, you know, a vision of a town hall about social and emotional learning, that is so important to engage with that with our families, because you know, that no one wants to talk about mental health and, and all this social, you know, emotional, which is so very vital. And, and that's, a, um, they're, they're, you know, that middle school age, they're, they're so vulnerable. Like, you know, we're dealing with vaping, but there's other things that they're, they're, they're so vulnerable. And, and that is, you know, such an important age that we try to interact and, 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 and interact with our students and, talk, you know, talk about prevention. And it's not, and you know, starting with vaping, but it can open up the doors to many other things, you know sexual education, different topics that we can, you know, work with our students. And this is so, so important. I love this, you know. And, um, you know, Brian touched on some, you know, sustainability uh, things and where the funding coming from because I hate to see the plug pulled up yeah, on this. Yeah, no, and, we agree. And this is so, so, so important. I, I really love this, you know. And, and like he said, I love to get, you know, get involved and engage, you know, with, with, with these projects that you're doing and other things you plan to do. All right. You're both hired. <laughs> <laughs> Member Dugan, Member Gately. All right. Well, great. Thank you for this great work. Um, I think just being a parent of a high school student, you know, if you know, there are fights at school, and when he comes home and there's a fight, he's not involved in them, but it rattles him, you know, and so it, it affects more than just the children that, you know, are involved in the altercation. Uh, you know, he comes home and that's the first thing he, he wants to tell me about because mm -hmm. it rattles him. So I, I think this is all great, great work that you're doing. Um, so my question is um, just the data we might be collecting just to see, you know, how we're progressing with, with things like this at our schools and, you know, um, you, touch on that? you know, is there any data that, you know, would show this, Ye this uh, you know, theoretically this should all work, but what would be collecting data to, to Yep, see sure. So yeah. attendance data, discipline data, the um, type of referrals you would dig down to. And then what is this, on the other side, what is the student involvement data, the attendance at after school clubs and sports? You know, we see, as you know, we see our sports are down a little bit yeah. in high school. Yeah. Um, so you would, those are the types of data points that we discuss when we meet in the monthly meetings. 
we that. also the youth health risk survey right, right. that we do um, we we've been diving into that really trying to analyze mm -hmm. how kids answered questions and right. mm -hmm. information that we got out of it yeah. so that would also be part of it as oh, well. oh and thank you the um, schools do uh, some cell the schools themselves their cell team will do um, some surveys to students to like check-in surveys to students as well yeah mm -hmm. yeah and you said something really important about sports I mean it's yeah that it's, data being down it, yeah. it's concerning to me because you know what are the kids doing after school right. are, they, are they around a coach are they you know, they right. go into practice as their regiment to their day. And, mm -hmm. right. you know, all those things are very important. So I'm glad that's something you guys. You're yeah, thank you for saying that. that. I, You yeah. know, the, um, there's so many benefits to sports, Absolutely. obviously. Yeah. But one of the biggest ones is managing frustration mm -hmm. and being able to manage frustration in the heat of the moment, you know, when you're really being competitive. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you have that type of grace? And that takes practice. You know, that just doesn't happen mm -hmm. overnight. You're not born with that. No. Um, and so, you know, when you think about the elementary schools and the play type of um, curriculum that's coming in there, that, that type of work is really Im imperative. And right. so there is a connection to that. And there is a connection, like Brian said, to learning about de-escalation, like learning about, you know, what happens when your heart is beating really fast and how to take a few breaths. Like we don't talk explicitly about how we check in like mind, body, soul. Mm -hmm. um, and so that type of work is important. And that's why you see a lot of mindfulness in the cell work in cell curriculum. So all of that is connected, but <laughs> we have to sell it. Like that's what we do in education. And so um, I, that's why we have to build the councils and build the, build the curriculum around it. Right. Yeah. The other piece too is just family engagement. You know, all the data just, when families are engaged, uh, you know, it's gonna help all mm -hmm. around everything, SEL, academics, everything. So this is all great work and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it as we go. So thank you, thank yeah. you for this. Yeah. I, I have a uh, member Bailey, but if you don't mind, I'm just gonna jump to um, school community member Brown, student representative Brown, who had her hand up. Um, yeah. Hold on. Um, I know a lot of my friends have concerns about like cyberbullying, like mm. what happens online, like because I know a lot of like internet drama really fuels the in-school fights if they have each other on like Snapchat or Instagram. Mm -hmm. Like, would there be anything to help with cyberbullying? Yeah, you know, thank you so much for asking that question. And like, kudos, this is your first school committee meeting. I didn't, I haven't spoken at school committee since ever, since I've been here since August. So, like, 100% thank, <laughs> thank you. It is thank not you. easy. Is that, that was fab that was really fabulous. And, and actually, as a matter of fact, thank you for asking, because I forgot to thank John Mackin, who um, is our new officer, right, who just stepped in. Um, we just had a conversation today about bringing in speakers around um, safety, internet safety, and um, cyberbullying, and how to protect yourself. So we're working on that right now. So thank you for your question. Thank you. It's a great point, Representative Madison. Thank you. Uh, I have Member Gailey, and then Member Magnolia, and then Member Coppola. <clears throat> Well, I want to get on the committee with Brian. <laughs> okay. um, but I am like thrilled about Tony Seaforth because years ago um, I was really pushing for that after school program. He was talking to me about it. Um, I was always a strong believer that what our students were lacking was some kind of supervision for their studying because the parents at home don't know our curriculums that are ever changing. So. Um, this pilot for the middle school, I think, is awesome. Um, I'm hearing good things about it. Mm -hmm. And how long has it been going? Since January yep. or all year? No, since January. Because we started meeting as a committee in November. Okay. And so that was one of the first, those were one of our first ideas. So my first thought is, um, will we expand it to the other middle schools? Yes. That's the hope. That's the idea. That is the hope. Mm -hmm. Next yeah. year. Yeah, we just started the pilot in Breed because um, as who was the, whose son goes to the classical one? Was it it's Lenny? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so right. the convenience of being right across the street, yeah. right? Um, but I have to say, I thank you for calling out Tony Seaforth because what makes Tony Seaforth's program so successful is he has vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so his end adaptability and flexibility. His vision for the middle school is different 
than his vision for the high school. And so he he's, you know, because you can't just take a model and apply it somewhere else. Um, and so that that's really the key to his success, <laughs> vision and very specific goals and data to support those goals. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the work that, that we have ahead of us. Yeah, he was, he, we spoke and I think it was the mayor's, like he had a get together and we were speaking there, Tony and I. But um, the other thing is, um, with vaping, mm -hmm. um, in the bathrooms, there are such things as vaping alarms, and I don't know if maybe we want to invest in some vaping alarms so that when a student is vaping, they get caught more quickly, but I don't, it's like- We smoking. have looked into that. I know Kevin and I have talked about it too. Um, we're tr we get mix mixed, mixed, um, reports about what the, the effectiveness of them. Uh, so we're trying to do more research on really, is it worth the funding to do it? If, because if they, they're not gonna do what we need them to do, yeah. it's not worth spending thousands and thousands of dollars to do it. Uh, the idea in itself is a good idea, but they're not always effective. So we wanna um, look deeper into that. Yeah, Lorraine, and you're, you're correct on how much loss of learning time there is with the vaping in the bathrooms, but what we sort of dove into in, with the youth risk data is we have some dependency, we have some real concern around dependency on vaping. So this isn't, we have a certain population that is addicted. Um, and so we have to look at that kind of programming to support those students. Because in addiction, it's not a choice. Mm. I know. Just let's not get right. started. Yeah. I would love that. Just don't start. I used to tell my students. And um, I think that's all for me. Thank you very much. Member Kapoor. Oh, no, sorry. Member Magnolia. I had Member Magnolia and then Member Kapoor. Yep. Thank you very much for the report. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just curious if you could break down the sort of practicality of how this works at the elementary, middle school, and then high school level, because a lot of these are um, kind of smushed together and I'm having a hard time understanding how um, any of these uh, various interventions work differently at different levels. Um, obviously, um, having you know a, a kid in elementary school, one of the things uh, that became really clear is that um, she happens to be at one of the elementary schools where they don't have a lunchroom. And because they don't have a lunchroom, they, they eat lunch in their classroom. Well, one of the things that happens is that you can't be rowdy in a classroom the way you might be in a lunchroom with regards to noise levels, right? Um, and so some of my, I guess, concerns about working through these issues prior to middle school and elementary school is where do you get that energy out, right? If you're always sitting at a desk, if you can't talk as loud as you want for 20, 30 minutes a day just to get that out, um, I, I definitely can say that, um, you know, her teacher has expressed through, you know, the text messages we get and whatnot that, you know, discipline has been an issue, like volume levels have been an issue. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking about interventions at the elementary school level and whether or not they assume that there are things in place at the elementary school that could de-escalate that when that may not be true, right? If you don't have a lunchroom, you don't have a lunchroom. So it doesn't matter how much you're talking about like emotional regulation. We know that younger kids, they just need to get those things out and two 10 minute, you know, breaks for, um, uh, for recess just is not enough time in the day when you don't have that lunch period in the middle to also do that. Um, so that's the nature of why I'm asking the, the different levels of intervention. We're talking about before school or after school. Um, but our elementary schools pose very unique challenges to mm -hmm. some of this, some of these um, interventions just in the way the school day is structured. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, sure. We we do have conversations about how at, in our in our team meeting, in our monthly team meeting, we absolutely talk about what it would be um, you know, appropriate and and age appropriate for an elementary model versus middle versus high school. I think your your point about the lunchroom per se, like that specific also speaks to how important the building culture, climate, and conditions are and how the building itself impacts the learning and the experience for the students as well and how you couldn't just have a district designed 
mm. you know, model, even with that model, it would need to be adapted to the conditions in the school. But you're right. I mean, we really, we have, we do so much in six and a half hours a day. There is not enough time. And there, and movement, you know, there's a whole, we all know the kinesthetic yeah. uh, connection with learning and movement. And so how to weave that in is absolutely um you know, on the on the docket for discussion moving forward. Thank you. Member Kapoor. Um, I'm wondering about the Educational Plan Learning Center. What specific, how many students does that involve? Yep, you know, it's how, brand new. Yeah. So past practice is not great. So our past practice for students who face long-term suspension is that we offered two educational programs, but we didn't offer um, in-person support. Mm -hmm. Or if we had tutoring, academic tutoring, it was one hour a day or maybe a couple hours a week. Um, and so that's why we felt, and, and also the reasons that students were um, facing long-term suspension is for all these reasons here. Um, so they need the support. Mm. So we have a, it's a beautiful space in the Boys and Girls Club. Um, we estimate it can house about eight to 10 people. Um, at, now remember, suspensions run, you know, on they run on their own time frame. So mm. you, there's no day that you're suspended and day that you're not suspended mm. as a group. There's no cohort of students. The students would come and go according to the, their need. Um, but it would be like a learning center. So there, there'd be a, um, we're posting for a special ed teacher, a paraprofessional, a floating uh, social worker, um, having the, an SRO float through, um, and an administrator to check on them. But the, the idea is to be able to have that in-person support that students need. Okay, and um, how many days would they be there for for what for the entire the whole, potentially five days the whole five days the whole five days yeah they would okay. get like full time that's why we're so excited about it yeah. they would yeah like what student need like there I can't think of another student that needs a full day of one on practically one on one attention or one to eight attention than than these students okay. and the boys and girls club they're so generous anyways but um. Ha are allowing us to utilize the gym, you know, yep. to allow them to run off some of the steam that they might need to run off, mm -hmm. um, you know, out of frustration or, or whatever. Uh, but this really came as an idea out of necessity of getting kids back into a school environment, a learning environment in person. Mm -hmm. um, I've sat through a number of student hearings. Mm -hmm. They're hard to go through. As a, as a mom, mm -hmm. as an educator, they're hard to go through. Uh, but some of the offenses are very serious offenses, mm -hmm. and you can't just send them back to a school full of kids. Mm -hmm. And so, but at the same time, the educator in me and the mom in me says, but I also don't feel comfortable making you stay home doing online tutoring. Mm -hmm. Where's the, the human side of that? And so we talked a lot about we need something in between um, traditional school, mm -hmm. alternative school, something in between. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is what we kind of came up with. And we went to see Boys and Girls Club. It is a beautiful space. Um, and they've been very generous um, with the extras that we mm -hmm. are allowed to utilize uh, if, once we get there. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you for the update. I think uh, we all recognize that the uh, this is a really important issue to, to, the, to our community and, and really appreciate the task force uh, taking it on. And I think it represents a lot of underlying needs that we knew were, were um, something we had to work on before the pandemic that were significantly aggravated by, by the pandemic and, and sort of uh, getting students the social emotional support they need and the mental health need and I, and I really appreciate the the student focus that the, that the task force has taken um, and I think that's these approaches that you're talking about is are great news um, I think we all in in, in, in and Lynn want to be in a community that where everybody feels safe and feels like they belong and I think you know the, the school committee and the Lynn public schools uh, really taking that on ourselves uh, 
serves everyone. It certainly serves the students and it serves the community at large. So I, so I really appreciate the, the work on that. Thank you. And thank you to the school committee for the thoughtful comments and questions. Goals, progress check-in. So first, let me say, I'm not going through this whole document with you tonight. <laughs> uh, there is a lot on here. Um, uh, the reason I have it at this meeting is to share with you, you know, in the fall, I did this document sharing, you know, what our goals were going to be this year, uh, what our key actions would be, uh, and then the district improvement um, uh, yeah, district improvement goals, the strategic goals. Um, and so I was just thinking, how am I going to share with you all the work that, that we do day in and day out that link to this document? So everywhere that there is blue writing is uh, information that is being shared with you around how it links to that indicator, that goal, that strategic objective, okay? And then as you go through, you'll see when you get it electronically, which I believe you've already gotten it, mm -hmm. there are hyperlinks embedded in, and when you click on a hyperlink, it might be a PowerPoint of a presentation that was done, a PowerPoint of a training that was done, um, you know, data that, that's being shared. Uh, so this is really just kind of um, an opportunity for you to be able to see evidence of the work that we do that is linked to our strategic planning and our district improvement goals, okay? So as you go through it at your leisure, <laughs> um, if questions come up or you want to talk about it or hear more about a specific uh, piece, please reach out uh, to Mary, myself, uh, we, I will get you what you need. I could set up an individual meeting. I could bring something to a, me a future meeting uh, that you might want to know more about. Okay? So that's all I really wanted to say about this. I want to say thank you for this because I was looking at the, when you sent it out, like the hyper, all that information is, is fabulous to see that. And to see, a, um, yeah. It's going to, this is a helpful document too for when we start to develop the next phase of this play. I, 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 I see it and it's, it's awesome to say, I, I saw it in the beginning where I worked on the district wide strategic plan but to see where we're at today with it. It's incredible. Like, I, I actually have the, I have a whole folder of when we worked through it. And I was looking at it, like it's just to see plans implemented. Like vision is one piece, but the implementation is an art. Like to have a team in a district like that committed, um, from staff to just everyone involved, and, and it's it's really commitment. And the commitment is is inspiring. It's always inspiring me. It keeps me here. It keeps me going. It keeps me fired up, um, and it gets me excited, especially when I see those. Uh, you know, meeting social emotional need, uh, those attributes and see what, what's been done to, uh, to, to do what we do. Yeah, no, it's, I want to say thank you to everybody involved in our operation. And I want to welcome Dr. Alvarez, who will be uh, part of this process. So, uh -huh. excited. Yeah. A lot I'm, of, excited. A I'm pretty excited. I'm yeah, no, up, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, guys, just, I know it's 8.05. I know it's late, but like. <laughs> I just I felt I wanted you <laughs> to have the information uh, that sh shows <clears throat> how much work does go into <clears throat> this and that we are not just sitting on our hands. We, mm -hmm. we are trying very hard to move our district forward and um, do what's best for our teachers and our students. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent, for that update. Uh, that's very helpful. Next item is a net school spending update, and uh, we wanted to keep the committee apprised of uh, correspondence with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on net school spending. Obviously, a topic that's been um, much discussed in this in this forum, uh, and so we want to keep everyone in the loop. Uh, the superintendent recently received a letter uh, from Desi uh, with. Uh, the overall good news that we are on track this year for net school spending, um, you'll recall that there's a delay um, from finding out sort of where we land on net school spending that's pretty significant from when you actually set the budget to the when the numbers come back as certified because it depends on the 
actuals and those actuals take time to um, work their way through the system. But uh, so the, for the 21-22 school year, the fiscal year 2022, <coughs> we were certified at uh, 99.5% of net school spending. And, and of course the target is, is 100% and the commitment is 100%. So then that 0.5% then gets carried over to the next year, uh, which is the fiscal year 23 uh, that we're in currently. And as you see here in the letter, <coughs> the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, expects us, based on what's projected, for us to exceed the 100%, and that includes the carryover from the from the prior year. 5%. Right, the 0.5%. So that's that's good news. Of course, <coughs> that um, uh, projection is just that. The actuals will depend on what is actually spent in the year we're in now, and we won't know that for another year. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll keep a close eye on that. Uh, Mr. McHugh works very closely with Mr. Bertino, the city CFO, and, and, and really everyone involved to, to keep an eye on those numbers as they uh, unfold. And if it becomes necessary, based on sort of a, a lower actual than projected, then we would go, the city would go to the school uh, net school spending stabilization fund that was created like we did earlier this year and make an additional appropriation. Um, and of course, that uh, projection to be over 100% of net school spending also represents the almost $30 million increase that we all did in the last budget. Um, so it continues to be, I think, a really strong investment. Mr. McHugh? Yeah, just, I actually did look into, I was curious why we were under, and because we spend all our budget numbers down on our side, so I was looking at the city side, and actually the city expenses were pretty much on. Actually, the difference was on the city side, they get revenues, we get revenues, we get charter school reimbursements. The projection that the state projected, we don't put it into the report, the state put in, it was uh, roughly like $2.4 million. We actually got over $4 million. Okay. So that gets subtracted from the actual cost. So that brought down the number. So that's actually the rationale why we fell below the net school spending for that year is because every year when we do the report, there's a number that's frozen in there from the state saying this is what we project you to get in charter school reimbursements. And then when it truly gets set at the end of the following year, they change the number. So in this case, that was the difference for why we actually fell because I, I was checking the health insurance numbers and everything was like pretty much right where it was projected to be. So they were, the city side was spot on, I thought, this year. And it just bothered me, so I looked into it. So this year, it really was based on getting more money back to the city for charter school reimbursements than what was projected, which dropped our number our down. Book. So I, I figured I'd add that to the- uh, Yeah, that's, re that's very helpful, thank you. So, thank you. So we're projected again, and the number for our charter for this coming year is even, it's already in there, it's higher than we got this past year. So they, they're creeping it up, which is, is a good thing. Yeah, great, great news. Any questions? Yeah. Remember yeah. <clears throat> the problem with that is if, if they do the same thing and they increase our amount, um, we need to be able to um, do something about that before because I don't. I hate to see us be at 95 percent, as well as, you know, 1.2.57. That amount of money surely could have been used somewhere in the system. No. I mean, if you said to the teachers, "Do you need anything?" Because we had an extra 1.2. They definitely were gonna would be able to tell us where we had our needs, and we do have needs. We continue to have needs, so it concerns me that that one thing would set us off. You know, I mean, your books are always perfect, Kevin. There's never even a question there. You know, and it's just that I still I get the hair on the back of my neck sticks up about us with not meeting a hundred percent because we went through such a difficult time you know with um, going so low and getting fined by the state and I, I just don't want to see that happen to us again as well as this is money we could really use so how, how do we resolve that if they send us again a large amount of money how are we absolutely going to know 
how to spend that. Thank you, Member Capola, and I appreciate the question because it was certainly the case that, that several years ago that we were behind in net school spending. Yeah. Uh, th- th- we are going to be at 100 percent in net school spending, and I think we, you know, we we've, we've talked about this before, but the the 99.5 percent is a point in time, so that 0.5 percent gets spent the next year. So we are going to be hitting that obligation. We are. Uh, at fully funding the schools, and that and that and that's the that was the the point of the letter here. So the the what what happened uh, several years ago is that the not only was the uh, spending coming in at uh, several percentage points below 100, but mm-hmm. then it was not being made up in the next year, and that's the point at which the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education starts saying we're out of compliance and starts the fines. Th- this letter is saying that we are in compliance. And, uh, you know, I, I think because of the moving target of the actuals, which is, mm-hmm. you don't get until a year after. So it could be the charter reimbursement, but it could be the health insurance that Kevin mentioned, uh, or it could be another number that is different than what is budgeted, because that, that happens in budgeting. You're, 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 when, you, when you set a plan, a responsible budget, you want to give yourself some, some room in case something happens. And so... Uh, the it's it's no surprise that often actuals are not going to be exactly at where the projections are the another way to address that would be to say okay we'll fund the schools at 105 percent of net school spending and then you're, you're guaranteed to be over it we're not guaranteed but it's incredibly likely the city is not in a financial position to fund the schools at 105 percent of net school spending some communities are able to do that, and, and we're just not in that position. So uh, the city is absolutely committed to fully funding the schools and uh, complying in full with these net school spending requirements. Uh, and you know, we, we are in the fortunate position because of the Student Opportunity Act that the 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 actual dollar amount that we're talking about, if you take the percentage out of it uh, for a minute, is increasing by millions, of, tens of millions of dollars uh, each year. So you know, I, I think we're in a pretty strong financial position with the public schools. Yeah, America, to be honest. There's also restrictions with that school spending, correct? That kind of put us in a real difficult position when we're getting a lot. Uh, well, that's why Kevin does a fabulous job. But I think is it something that so you're partnering up with the city side? Is that is that what's, what we're doing? So in ter- the criteria for that school spending, it's it hasn't updated. Yeah, I I, I think um, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think maybe what you're alluding to is some of the. Uh, items that the city spends on education that doesn't count towards the net school spending requirement, yes, right? Yes. So transportation is one of those. Um, so whatever we spend on transportation doesn't count towards net school spending. Another big one is uh, the the capital needs of the schools. So we, we have, a, I think, a pretty um, significant maintenance budget. Uh, any projects that are over $150,000 do not count towards net school spending. So the, the maintenance budget that would count towards net school spending are only projects under $150,000. We all know that the cost of building maintenance has increased significantly over the last several years. That cap is artificially way too low, and, and it's certainly a priority of ours uh, with the state and, and, and specifically legislature, because I think it'd be a legislative change, uh, to address that. And, and the state delegation has been uh, working with us and been really helpful in, in helping us to try to, to make that case. Thank you, Joe. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? All right. Superintendent's report. Okay. Uh, as usual, I have a quote to start us off. Uh, it's an Irish proverb. It is March, however. Um, when a twig grows hard, it's difficult to twist it. Every beginning is weak. As this quote shares, anything new begins weak and tender, like new growth on a plant and strengthens strengthens with time from year to year. This year began with many new plantings, pruning back and transplanting for new growth. It's been the year of beginnings in so many ways. 
the beginning of building a foundation of stabilization in the systems we work in, beginning of rebuilding our instruction to meet the needs of our most underser underserved students, the beginning of implementing many new curriculum resources at every level, and the beginning of welcoming many new leaders, the most important being our new superintendent, Dr. Yvonne Alv Alvarez, to bring us to the next level of our work as a district of educators. I want to officially welcome Dr. Alvarez into our community. She has completed day two <laughs> of her new journey in Lynn, spending time at Druitt's, Shoemaker Callahan, and Sewell Anderson, reading to their students for a Read Across America. It was truly a wonderful day to spend together. As noted in the goals update, there, ha uh, there has been much we've been working on to build a strong foundation and to help our students move forward in the growth of their learning. This process is complicated and slow, but if we continue to share ideas, progress monitor our work, and stay committed to the course, we will be successful for the benefit of our students' growth. Although there are many areas we need to improve on and develop, there are many other ways we are positively impacting and working on our district goals and improvements. I'm excited to share some updates from the Multilingual Education Department. This month, the mayor and I were pleased to receive a notice from the Department of Education <coughs> that the MLE Department has successfully completed the tiered focus monitoring cycle and that monthly progress reports are no longer required. In its notice, DESE gave a strong recommendation to continue current ELE program initiatives, particularly rewarding curric uh, regarding curriculum and instruction. This recommendation was made based on our continuous growth of L enrollment, the needs of our effective ELE program, as well as the required activities to promote and support the rapid acquisition of English language proficiency by English learners. This is the first time DESE has released the district from ELE monitoring mid-cycle and is a testament to the intentional shifts Lynn has made to support multilingual learners across the district. This news is not surprising to me since the MLE department's work is being recognized across the state, the Northeast, and across the country. In the span of just a few weeks, the MLE department will be sharing the work happening in Lynn at the national level, the regional level, and the state level. Last week, Amanda Campbell, Rania Caldwell, and Jackie Gallo presented Lynn's development of interdisciplinary units at the National Association for Bilingual Education, or NABE, in Portland, Oregon. On March 11th, Amanda Campbell and Rania Caldwell will be presenting what to expect when expecting a dual language program at the Multi-State Association of Bilingual Education, or MABE, in Connecticut. During the MABE conference, Amanda Campbell will also serve on a roundtable discussion on equity and the implications of the science of reading on dual language programs. Lynn will also serve on a DESE panel during the MABE conference focused on the impact of grant funding in developing and implementing an effective dual language program. And finally, Rania Caldwell recently served on a panel at the Massachusetts Urban Superintendents Meeting as the elevation of the needs of multilingual learners are being centered across the state. Other highlights in our district, um, we have an unsung hero, Hannah Schreck, She's a speech pathologist who works in our TEAMS program. She was uh, working with certainly nonverbal students. There was a featured uh, post on our Facebook post. Two of her students are now using their eyes to communicate via technology. It is so amazing to see students who for their whole lives have not had a voice to suddenly be able to express themselves and their wants and needs. Another uh, important uh, progress that we're making, student successes. Students from Lin Lincoln Thompson and Fallon Elementary School were recognized by Department of Ed for their outstanding achievement on the MCAS All Portfolios. Those are not easy to do. 
Lynn Classical High School's Special Education Department recently hosted a Special Education Family Night on February 15th. Staff met with parents for an, uh, for an in-person one-to-one conference to uh, give updates and answer questions for parents. Tables were set up for parents to explore resources such as center board, meet and greet with special ed transition specialist Jimmy McDonald to learn about 688, the 688 process. Fresh Start uh, teacher Eric Werner was available to highlight transition programming for students who may be interested in the 18 to 22 programming. And a clothing drive was also available for students and families in need. And there was also snacks, of course. Relationship, in relationship building, general education students at the Hood School are supporting social relationships with students in our coach classrooms during their social emotional learning time. And the Life Skills Action Plan team updates, uh, that hyperlink will bring you to a document that um, I have shared in the past. Um, you'll see when you open it, there are purple um, sections and the purple sections are some of the updates that have happened uh, you can read through it uh, some of the uh, most recent they, we've added for our uh, improving the Lynn community social opportunities we've we've we have a best buddies program added to Lynn English and Marshall uh, Lynn uh, classical already had it so we've expanded that uh, we've created a system where teachers can request buses needed for community trips, pre-vocational experiences, business tours. The recent trips at uh, Lynn Tech for the 18 to 22 and Fresh Start program include, they went to Haven for Hunger, Kitty Cat Cafe, Lynn Police Department, Arc Center at Liberty Tree Mall, Kettle Cuisine, uh, Cape Ann Animal Aid, Whole Foods, and they're planning, um, the planning started to hold Best Buddy Dance uh, for all participating schools in the spring. So you'll see there's other pieces that have been added to that. And then uh, you heard tonight about the Biliteracy Pathways uh, Awards and our effort to elevate the linguistic abilities of our students um, for grades five and eight. And our peer mediation coordinator, Ginny Keenan, shared that 20, uh, 200 Valentines uh, for a life care center and Abbott House nursing home were created by the Lynn English High School students. And you have some pictures there of them doing that and the Valentines that they made. These are just a few examples of how hard our staff and students are working to repair, catch up, and to strengthen the metaphorical twig uh, that is uh, twig so that it's uh, difficult to twist and break. So we're still in the new growth stage. And we're building to get that strong twig that you can't twist and break. Excellent. Juntos logramos. See no further business. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Wow, 825. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was